five seconds of silence before and after the second you start splicing together. So away we go. Welcome, you're listening to the best of investing on Talk 910. This is the show where we present valuable information about real estate, the financial markets, and other economic business of the day. And for those of you listening for the first time, because we do have a lot of new listeners, here's our format. A few guys and gals sitting around a bar having drinks without the drinks, talking with you, the audience. We're talking business with you, the audience listening in. I'm your host, Edward Brown, and I'm pleased to have as my co-host, Mark Hahn of Pacific Private Money, California's fastest growing private lender, and Catherine Harris of Parati and Karad. Our phone number is 888-912-1190. Write that number down, 888-912-1190, because you're going to use that number to answer the trivia question for three vacations given away during each commercial break. That's right, we're giving away nine vacations during this show. Now, those vacations are not sponsored by the radio station, but by a lighthouse resort and marina located one hour northeast of San Francisco. And the vacations are free. Their only request, a $75 cleaning fee to cover housekeeping expenses. Their website is lighthouse4fun.com. You can reach them at 916-777-5511. And today's trivia theme is, where did they come from? You'll understand when we get to the question. Our website is bestofinvesting.com. Check us out on Facebook and YouTube by typing Best of Investing Radio Show. We're also on television, Comcast, Channel 26 and at and Channel 99 on Saturdays at noon and Sundays at 6 p.m. And today's special guest is Julie Kennedy. She was re- yeah, she was referred by our other co-host, Rob Spinoza. And Julie is a real estate agent with? Marin Modern Real Estate Marin. in San Rafael. Okay. And um, Julie, tell us, uh, I'll tell you what, I'm going to get right into an email that we received uh, from a listener who was asking, because you know, we have lots of new listeners, lots of emails, and this one happens to be right up your alley. So I'm going to ask this email of you, and then I know you've got some other good articles to share with us. But this person says, I'm thinking of selling my house FISBO, which we all know means for sale by owner. What are my risks? Convince me that hiring an agent is smarter. Is that a good question? Well, <clears throat> excuse me. It, it's a great question. And I, I have to say that um, my first question to the uh, homeowner would be why? The same on a commission. Yes. That's okay. usually typical. Well, I don't think anybody is, is entitled to 5% commission. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's interesting because I think the average consumer, particularly someone who hasn't sold their home uh, in, in the recent past, may not understand the breakdown of uh, the funds. So they're not giving a single person 5 or 6% commission. And by the way, all commission is negotiable. So okay. even though people say, oh, 5%, in fact, it is against the law to um, indicate to uh, the, the consumer that, that that is a set fee. In fact, it's negotiable. Oh, very, that, didn't realize that. Very good. Do you feel like a realtor earns their fee, whether it's 5% or 6%? I, well, I absolutely do. And I can tell you that um, we only get paid when we complete the job. In other words, I'm not paid on an hourly basis. So when I go in to work, for a client, let's say their house doesn't sell. Let's say we look and look for the perfect home for them and they're a buyer and we don't find it. I don't receive any compensation whatsoever. So the times when I am working for a client, not only is there um, the issue of those times when I don't earn any money, but then I'm turning on the juice because I have a client that I'm going to invest 100% of my time and energy and I would expect that my client would give me 100% of their loyalty sure. and their trust. Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I was just thinking about for this one specific uh, person who emailed in, that, I, and I know this is the case, and I'm sure you'll back me up on this, that when a person says, you know what, I, I want to just sell my house myself, and I'll save on the commission, and let's say it's a, a, just think it's a, a million dollar piece of property. Nowadays, especially in California, people are fairly sophisticated. So if they find out, which they will, that it's for sale by owner, they're going to say, well, you're not paying a commission, so they're I'm going to lower the price. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, in fact, that ends up a lot of times costing the person more. Though, though in other words, the, the seller will do net less mm-hmm. than if they used an agent. Do well, you find that the case? Yes, absolutely. And, and one of the things that I've found is that even if it, whether it's a for sale by owner or a seller who wants to negotiate a very low commission, um, I can actually generally show a client how I could net them more as a commission um, seller's agent than if they were a FISBO. For example, um, 
with my company, one of the things, our, our tagline is modern real estate for modern times. And that's so important today because of the internet. I mean, the statistics yeah. show that, I mean, it, it, it was an exponential change from the number of people who actually searched online for a home, let's say in 19, or let's say 2002 to now. It's probably, I, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but it's, it's in the 80 plus percent of people who go online to look for their home. Now, if you're a for sale by owner, where are you going to list your home for those for that eighty five? Craigslist. <laughs> <laughs> well, Good luck. Yeah. Okay. Right, yeah. yeah. right next to free right next to free dirt. Exactly. Yes. <laughs> and one of the things about my company or our company is that when you when you Google Marin Real Estate, we're one of the, the first we're on page one of the pop ups. You can go to oh, our really? site, oh. you can shop to your heart's content. You don't have to um, register or sign up, you can look and you can see what's come on the market, what's new, you can put in all of your criteria. Now why would someone selling their home not want to take advantage of that sure. that format? What I was going to bring up was account plan or the changes in the laws in the last few years. Just oh. the complexity and the oh, obligations disclosures. and the, the disclosures yeah. that point. you as a seller must make. And if you're going into this blindly or as somebody who hasn't sold a home or maybe sold a home or has and not in the last five, ten years, you're still not current and may not know. Yeah, selling your haunted house and forgetting to tell people it's haunted. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, absolutely. And, and that's what's so interesting is that um, when when an agent representing a buyer sees that they're that the buyer's interested in looking at a FISBO, they they know that the the, the homeowner is gonna probably ask them for advice. And technically they can't. Give advice because just by answering a simple question, there's something that happens and it's called implied agency. Oh. So suddenly, guess what? You're now working for the owner too. And that's a good that's a very good point. A lot of people don't I don't think a lot of people realize that. Well at the end of the day, you know, look, there's just there's just no free lunch. We all know that. And so if you're gonna do, you know, for sale by owner, you're probably not gonna get the price that you know your experienced realtor would capture. You just don't have the exposure, you don't have the sales techniques and yeah. the acumen. And, 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 and the negotiating skills. And the negotiating skills, The right. negotiating skills are huge. And again, what's so interesting, we do so much now with a computer, but nothing beats that relationship, that one-on-one -on -one yeah. that you have, let's say you're representing the seller, with the buyer's agent. And in Marin, we're a small, pretty relatively small community, and the active agents all know one another. Sure. And so, yeah, that's like that in, in most communities. Right. Yeah. And exactly. You know, he who acts as his own uh, attorney has a fool for a client. Exactly. Same thing because when you're talking about your own emotions uh, in yeah. there. Absolutely. I'll tell you what, we're going to cut to a, a but before we cut to a commercial break, because um, you seem to know a lot about real estate, um, how do people get a hold of you if they have questions about real estate? Well, they can go to the Marin Modern website and click on the agents and find me under Julie Kennedy or just Google Marin Modern Julie Kennedy and I'll pop right up. Excellent. Okay, we are going to cut to our first commercial break. We're going to go to a quick one here. When we come back, I know Catherine's got a couple of interesting articles. She wants to go on a tirade. I do. She said tirade. So audience okay. listening, you're going to listen for a tirade. Okay, uh, first commercial break, first trivia question on the TV show MASH. Where did BJ Honeycutt come from? Don't answer. Uh, last time I asked that on my, I have a sports show. Yep. And right away, my guest answered it. Like within two seconds. Uh, I, you know, I, I go, don't. Uh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta warn these people ahead of time. Okay, the first three callers with the correct answer win a free three day, two night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Their website is lighthouseforfun.com. Call 888 912 1190. That's 888 912 1190 to answer this question. On the TV show MASH, where did BJ Honeycutt come from? Again, one more time 888 912 1190. Make sure to include your name, your email address, speak slowly, and spell out your email one letter at a time. Don't touch that dial because the best of investing is going to come right back with a tirade. Come. Catherine holding Harris, it holding it in, holding it in for that commercial break. Okay. <laughs> I'm fun so far? I'm looking, fun. I'm looking forward to this. Yeah. Okay. Should I like move up now? Yeah. Yeah. No, we, I did have a lot of tirades just, in the past. Yeah. So that's true. No, I <laughs> yeah, I brought up all kinds of tirades myself, you know, insurance fraud and all that. Oh my God. Yeah. Okay, am I doing okay? You're doing oh, great. You're doing great. Okay. Yeah, just remember, I know it's kind of hard because it's like you don't want to. Be rude and, and not go like this when talking. But. 
Alright. So we get back, we have to go right into the tire. <laughs> And what I've always told people is, even if you don't get a bunch or a few phone calls, it doesn't matter because what you do is you use this, uh, you know, be it on your um, you know, Facebook or social media type stuff. Or, you know, in your blog. I'm just going to stand outside and start selling autographs. There, there you, there you go. <laughs> oh, you know what? I've literally, I've had people, I've had people come up. And we'll be talking. And say, you told something. And then they talk about it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Show. What? And I, I told you this before, no. right? I was at, I was at the, I work out the bay bunch, and I usually, you know, I go you know, various times. I went in there on a, on a Monday, and I was working out. And some guy comes up to me and he says, he goes, yeah, I saw you on TV. You know, because we usually record on uh, our videographers on here today. Record for you. I said, I said, really? Where? He goes, yeah. He goes, I like, really? At the gym. What happened? Somebody decided to turn on that channel at the time that our show was on, so everybody who's on the elliptical is watching the show. That is, that's a great place to have it. Yeah. People stare at the elliptical. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Welcome back to the Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hahn, Catherine Harris, and our guest, Julie Kennedy. When we cut to the first commercial break, we asked this trivia question. On the TV show MASH, remember that old TV show? Mm -hmm. Where did BJ Honeycutt come from? No clue. Oh my goodness. You're going to be embarrassed when you find out. Do you know the answer, Julie? I think it's California. Somewhere yeah, okay, but where? California. Oh, like like nearby. Mill Valley. Mill Valley. No, no way. Mill Valley. Mill Valley. California. Oh yeah. God. You did explicitly say city. You could have said I just said, where did you come from? So <laughs> California would qualify. Uh, yeah, well, so would the earth, but that doesn't yeah. count. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now, Julie, or Julie, Catherine, you want to uh, get into your tirade? Uh, just a little bit. Okay. I feel like I need to take the opportunity just to communicate something to people. People have a tendency, or the government just came down with um, estate tax law, and they increased the exemption amount the limit before you are subject to an exemption tax, and it's about five million per person. Okay. So people have a tendency to think, "Oh, great! I don't owe estate tax. I'm walking okay. away. No yeah. more estate planning for me." Okay. And I want to take the opportunity to remind everybody: you need to do estate planning, uh, regardless of how much your estate possibly could be. If you're not going to be subject to estate tax, great, wonderful. But okay. you may, if your estate is We'll say over a hundred thousand, two hundred thousand. It can't, pop, and you don't have an estate plan uh, in place. Okay. All your money gets goes to the court, and the court has court fees. You have an estate attorney who has to be delegated to your case, and you have to break up your assets. So it goes through probate. That's goes, pretty expensive. It can go, and that's what people yeah. don't realize is that they forget to, they don't, they see this long term, I don't have to pay estate taxes. Yeah. So they forget about the importance of helping out their beneficiaries by taking a few hours a day, sitting down, going through with an attorney, and deciding what they want to do with their assets when they pass away. And people just choose not to do it. Yeah. Uh, or they choose not to update it. I actually, well, uh, on the way over here, I just read an article about people are forgetting to update their beneficiary forms with their 401k, their IRS. Oh, yeah. Those forms need to get updated. Think about it every five years. Who, who do I have listed? Do I want them still listed? Take the opportunity to do it. It's worth the time and, now rather and, than in the long well, run. Well, and those stocks that they manufacture buggy whips. I mean, who, where, where are those stocks going? I don't you know. know. You got to update that one, too. No, that's a very good advice. I just want people to remember that. I'm not sure about you guys, but I know a few people in my family who just choose not to do it. Especially if you have children. Uh, it's very important to get your will that taken care of and either consider doing a trust or just getting that stuff taken care of. It really helps out in the long run. Okay. Uh, I'll tell you what, since uh, you started on your tirade, we're going to ask you a question here that we got from one of our listeners. My bank has asked me for financials, but they want them reviewed by a CPA. 
EPA. Does your firm do that? How much it would, would it cost? I mean, why, why are they asking for that? Well, they give you a lot of reasons why they are asking for it. First, simple, easy answer for one thing. Yes, uh, my firm does do review of financial statements. We could do review financial statements, audited financial statements, or compiled financial statements if a bank choose to acquire them. Uh, depending if you're an individual or a corporation, I'm assuming it's a corporation, it's usually they want such financials to have some independent reassurance that the numbers that a company is presenting to the bank, if the bank's about to provide them a line of credit, they want to know that there's some someone else has looked at this and there's some reasonable accuracy to this information. Okay, because so the guy's probably not General Motors, can't afford you know hundreds of thousands of dollars for an audit. Yes, so exactly. what's the, what's the step below that? If the net, the first step below it is a review, okay. and the final step below that is a is a, com, a compilation, uh, and the fee it depends, as always. Uh, yeah, it sounds like a CPA talking. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> that is, that's not fair. But yeah, realtor right. would say the same thing yeah. about that. Yeah. Yeah, a like, lot like, of like, things. Yeah, like how much does a yeah, house cost? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, is it expensive? Uh, it can range. Uh, usually speaking, uh, we're talking a, a couple. Uh, we'll say between five and ten thousand dollars. Generally speaking, for, for review, for, for, for review, review oh, financial okay. statements, and it's a, again, that's a pretty small organization. Nobody who's got whole lot of um, unusual investments, but somebody's got maybe some inventory, some line of credit. Yeah, my guess is sale. that if the bank is asking for a review rather than just, you know, hey, give me, you know, just put together a little financial statement. I mean, if, if, it's, if it's just the average Joe, they're just going to ask for for just a probably a, a financial statement and be done with it. Yeah. But if it, it comes to the point where the bank is asking for a review, then the guy must be a little more sophisticated. Exactly. They yeah. usually have, they're usually asking for a line of credit that's, um, a little bit higher than maybe what they're what they are producing in income every year, year after year. Um, it might be just their financial health of the organization. They yeah. just want some reassurance. And you and I, I won't be surprised if banks have it where there's a limit. Depending sure. if you like if over you five do, million or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or if you just don't meet this certain makeup, you need yeah. to have that. Or if you do, you have to have a review. If you have X Y Z dollars. And the review is not a guarantee. I mean, all it is just that someone's looking over. Older. Exactly. Then just it's having somebody. What a review is is having somebody come in. It would be our firm would come in, and we take a look and look at your bank accounts and see if that makes sense. Does it, is there actually a bank account? Is it listed in the name of the company? Does yeah. it actually have the five hundred thousand it says it has in it? Well, that's uh, actually a pretty re reasonable fee then, because I know that generally audits get really deep, and that's you're talking fifty thousand or more usually. Well, yeah, it could go fifty thousand or more depending on the the type of audit you're going to get. Like some audits we can do for 20,000. Nonprofits, yeah. you obviously generally are generous and you sure. want to give back to the community and usually go at a, low, a lower rate. That's nice. Uh, well, hey, we like the community. <laughs> We're here in Larkspur. <laughs> yeah. I'm born and raised. The partners in the firm are all born and raised here. We, we It's important to give back. Okay. Um, but yes, a review is a good step down, especially if you want to, you can negotiate. Those things can actually be negotiated with your bank. So if the bank is if okay. a review is too expensive for you, but you they want something, you can try to negotiate a compilation. Or if you've got if you they're requiring an audit, then you can try to negotiate for a review. So you can kind of negotiate the price. Very good. You know what? That's a that's very good advice because a lot of times you, know, you think if the bank just says, "Hey, we need an audit," you know, you, you don't understand it's negotiable. You just do it. But that's a good point. You can, yeah. you can ask your bank, "Hey, look, you know, can I just go for a review or?" Or a compilation or a letter from my mother. Yes. Yeah, something like that. Um, so, uh, what firm do you work for? How do people get hold of you? Well, I work for Parati and Karat. We are in Larkspur. We can be, I can be reached at 415 461 8500. And we're full service. We could do uh, audited financial statements, review any type of test work that's needed or required. Uh, we also do tax returns and then can go to bookkeeping and answer a lot of tax questions Very for good. accounting. Okay. There you go. No, that, that helps. Tell you what, since we're on email time, uh, we're going to get Mark's email in here, and then when we cut to, after we cut to the come back from break, I know there's a lot of good articles floating around out there. I know Julie wants to cover something about you know this oh god, you know where are we starting a new one? I mean, it disappeared. It, it disappeared. Yeah. Where'd that yeah. bubble go? Where'd that bubble go? Okay. So uh, Mark, we got an email here. Uh, Kind of put you on your toes a little bit, okay? So we're gonna nail you on this one, okay? I know you have a fund because we've been talking about the fund that you have, which we'll get into that in a week. But uh, you used to do individual notes. Is there a conflict providing in between providing the two? No. Okay. Next question. <laughs> All right. That's a commercial break. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> so my company, Pacific Private Money, we have a mortgage pool fund, uh, which we use to 
make loans to real estate investors. In fact, Pacific Harbor Lending, we've been making loans to real estate investors for the past five years. We've made nearly 600 loans to people generally engaged in buying, fixing, and flipping, but not just flippers. We also make uh, other real estate secured loans, usually on non-owner occupied investment property. And we do that because the banks generally stopped making those loans after the subprime meltdown. They're kind of focused on home loans, and particularly refis for the last five years, where they've made just gobs and gobs of money. So the private money lending uh, field kind of blossomed in the last five years as we've uh, responded to uh, the fact that banks weren't making loans to real estate investors. They don't like making short-term loans. They don't like making you know, non-consumer type loans right now. And so we've been making a number of loans uh, uh, over the last several years. And um, until we started our mortgage pool fund in 2013 this year, we were doing individual notes. So we would uh, get a loan request, we'd underwrite it, we'd pull the credit, we'd do you know, the big fair loan application, the background check, preliminary title report, all the due diligence that we do on a loan request to see whether or not we believe it has the safety and security features that uh, we feel comfortable with, and then we present those, uh, present that loan application to um, our real estate, the, our lenders, our private lenders, and see you know who likes it and who wants it, and, and oftentimes more than one, and so, Sometimes there's a little bit of a of a fight to get uh, you know a particularly um, it's nice to be popular yeah a comp particularly compelling loan opportunity so um, so yeah we still do both right now we're doing um, we're funding individual loans with private individual capital and we're also funding loans from our mortgage pool fund which we are promoting right now and we're growing it it's going to take us several years to get the mortgage pool fund up to the size that uh, we feel is optimal. But in the meantime, we're, we're doing both. And so the question is, is, is there a conflict? Well, no, not really, because uh, essentially the way when we, st we started the fund, uh, I promised my fund shareholders that the fund would always get the first look at every deal that we green-lighted for funding. So it's basically right. a first right of refusal. Now, um, we actually do a significant amount of monthly loan volume, much more than the capital of the have uh, ready at any given time in the fund. So uh, until our fund grows to a certain size, um, we're going to be uh, always uh, having funding opportunities on individual notes for private lenders. And But we will also, as the fund moves ahead, when, as there's money in the fund, if we're underwriting a loan and there's money in the fund, we're going to give the fund that first uh, funding opportunity. So I don't consider that a conflict. In fact, if anything, it's a benefit for the fund. I I consider the fund to be kind of our primary relationship that we're developing right now as a lending source. And secondarily, my uh, individual investors will have opportunities for the fund individual notes that the fund is not in a position to um, take advantage of. Okay. Uh, maybe they just don't have the money yet. Right. Right. Okay. We're still growing the fund. The fund is a new product in 2013. We thought it was an optimal time to start a mortgage pool fund, primarily because I had so many new investor clients calling as a result of the radio show and as a result of our advertising and referral and other word of mouth and that uh, we have more uh, potential clients, potential investor clients than we have product. And so we decided we needed to put a fund together uh, to have a, um, a repository opportunity to be able to fund loans uh, uh, through, through a pooled device rather than relying on individuals. Yeah, that's a great idea. How do people get a hold of you? So for more information, uh, we're easy to find. Our website is pacificprivatemoney.com. That's pacificprivatemoney.com. We're located here in the Bay Area, and we're easy to reach any day at 415-883-2150. And we also have a new website for the other show called Mortgage Investing 101. Mortgageinvesting101.com for uh, more information about mortgage investing and trustee investing. Excellent. We're going to cut to our second commercial break, and when we come back, we're going to have some interesting articles from our hosts here. Here's our second trivia question on the TV show MASH once again. Where did Klinger come from? The first three callers, yeah, you have to know the show. The first three callers with the correct answer went a free three day, and they did not come from Mill Valley, by the way. Uh, the first three callers. Yeah, yeah. That's the answer I'm talking about. No, 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 it's not. <laughs> the first three callers with the correct answer went a free three day, two night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Check them out at lighthouseforfun.com. Call 888 912 1190. That's 888 912 1190 to answer this question on the TV show MASH. Where did Klinger come from? 
One more time, 888-912-1190. Make sure to include your name, your email address, speak slowly, spell out your email one letter at a time. Don't touch that dial because the best of investing will be right back. Excellent. Okay. Excellent. Does anyone know the answer to that one? <laughs> Holy Toledo. Yeah, I know the show. I, that's the thing. Yeah, you still don't know the show. Don't know the show. Do you know the show? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. She's probably barely old enough to remember Seinfeld. Seinfeld it's kind of crazy to know that when I watched Seinfeld. Mash was before Seinfeld. Yes, Mash was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, then, and then it was Friends. So it would be the Friends, question. Yeah. And then what's now? What's the new show that everybody watches? Is there? Is there like a... Uh, what's no. the Big Seinfeld? Bang Theory? Of, yeah. I, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, I've watched it. It's actually pretty funny. Yeah, Big Bang Theory, but I don't know if it's Seinfeld worthy. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, it's funny. My old, uh, old business partner from years ago. Uh, gosh, he was he'd be probably eighty years old when he was still alive. Um, when he was in the Korean War, he was the he was in radio with Klinger, Jamie Farr. Oh, yeah, really? Oh yeah. my gosh, how fun! <coughs> Excuse me. Say again? Oh, who knew? Oh, who knew? Who knew? Um, okay, so the. Um, and you had this interesting article. Yeah, so because right? the article I have dovetails off of that, so we can talk a little bit about what's happening okay. as we're uh, ending the third quarter and what, uh, what are we looking forward to potentially <coughs> in the fourth quarter of next year. Right. So just remember to get our crystal balls out. out. And remember, if you have to talk to them, just talk and they'll hear you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to look at me. That's okay. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Hahn and Catherine Harris. We're also in the studio here with Julie Kennedy. When we cut to the second commercial break, we asked this trivia question on the TV show MASH. Where did Klinger come from? Now, Julie, you say you know the answer to this one. Go ahead. Toledo, yep. Ohio. Toledo, yeah. Ohio. That is correct. Okay. And uh, Julie, you have an interesting article about uh, the bubble or the lack thereof. Well, I was uh, trolling through the uh, Chronicle, as I do every morning, and there's a, a little blog called On the Block, and um, well, it caught my eye, uh, but actually uh, verified what I was already seeing and sensing. Uh, the, the title of the article is, Price Reductions Indicate SF Buyers May Have More Power Than They Think. Really? Well, so I'm thinking, what does that mean? Well. First, we've been in this absolute frenzy where all the buyers are in these multiple offer situations. You anywhere from three to twenty-three offers of any of this. But what typically happens at the barrier is we get a little slowdown in August. Things get Get quiet, back to school, school, end of summer, all of that. And and actually, summer, summer generally is, is very quiet. So we're all waiting for things to pick up after Labor Day is traditionally like the, the last big season, sure. right before, I guess, Thanksgiving would be pretty much the end. And no one's around. It's eerie. We had an open house the weekend after Labor Day. And um, of course, it was also the football, opening day of the 49ers. It was a little hard yeah. 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 Especially. We didn't have a big screen. We didn't have anything to <laughs> offer the folks except lemonade. But it was kind of eerily quiet. And then in the morning, I also review the MLS. And we have these little arrows that point up and down if the price increases. But of course, we usually see decreases. There were very few of those in the past year. Suddenly, we're seeing lots of price decreases. So lots of factors are fueling this. I mean, number one, of course, is interest rates. Um, there are mo- There's more inventory. But I also think getting back to what I observed about with the buyers is they're tired of being beaten up. So oh, it's so a, sitting on the sideline rather I, than putting in an offer and being 33rd in line. 
I think so. So I, I, I and I also believe that sellers. Uh, I don't want to use the G word, but I think. What greedy? greedy? I don't know. I'm trying to think of which which one, which G we're talking. About. I would say gain, <laughs> beneficial. Yes. So they may be getting a little carried away. We also have a terminology called seller assisted pricing, where we're the experts and we say, well, we think you should list your house at one point two. Well, can we try it at one point three? <laughs> Usually the answer is sure, but just not the first two weeks. Ha ha ha. But you go for the one point three, and an educated buyer also should have an educated agent, and they're going to know that their buyer's probably overpaying. Now, it's okay to overpay if if you really want the house. If you really <laughs> want the house, if it's what we call an emotional house, yep. and there's a lot of connection, a lot of connection. You know, you've got all checks off yeah. all the boxes. All. But I think <laughs> yeah. that um, sellers are getting a little greedy, and I think buyers are getting are just kind of waiting now to see what the interest rate. Back change yeah. effect is going to have on the market, and they're waiting to see all this inventory come on, and it has been. Well, there's, an article, right. there's an article in the paper, and but more importantly, anecdotally, which I actually have heard this yes. from a number of realtors, and I'm experiencing it personally in volume in uh, our shop at Pacific Title Market. So the market's slowing down. We don't really know what that means just yet, other than the fact that it, it, it's, it's slowing down, we're not seeing a lot of uh, significant offers above market, we're starting to see price reductions, longer days on market in certain, certain areas, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, and so that's not necessarily might be a bad thing. Oh, I, I think it's that, a, a great thing. I'll just, tell you, 25% price appreciation, if you believe the, well, the median price right. increase, if you believe that, if the year over year. It's yeah, it's scary. That's what scares me. Mm -hmm. And so are you know the whole idea of wow, are we experiencing another real estate bubble and could it possibly burst? What factors could we be looking at down the road? Yeah, because a six little bit months? a little bit of inflation is good. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be fun. Yes. A little bit. But Well, I I think you know, we're we are actually really catching up to let's say the two 2007 high, but what we really need is a balanced market. We need a market that's not all from, all on the buyer's side or all on the seller's side. That creates sure. a, a much a healthier, a healthier yeah. and frankly, I mean, agents don't like it, buyers don't like it, and some sellers, yeah. sellers pretty, pretty much like it. They don't like it on the other yeah. way. It's on the buyer's side. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Because well, many well, sellers well, then, then become buyers. Well, 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 what was the interest rate? That we were looking at back in 07. I can't, I'm trying to remember now what was the. I actually think our look came out. It's a little something in like 6%. Mm -hmm. I think so I refined it in 07. So, we're, so we're not quite there yet. Right. Close. Well, let's, 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 let's visit that for a moment. Do you think that in 2007 prices were where they should have been, or were they grossly inflated based on easy money? And if you believe that the last high that we experienced in the real estate market was a result of a fervent belief that prices would continue to go up, fueled by easy money. That, I think you're right. There easy wasn't the, the metrics of, of is it affordable by the average homeowner weren't even coming into play. And so now here we are in, in 2013 and we're, looking, we're staring down the barrel of what, what's going to happen in the next six months and the next year in real estate. And we're getting back to this issue of, of affordability, and so I don't know that um, I don't know that it's really a, a good thing that uh, necessarily that we're quickly in many markets approaching 2007 levels because, quite frankly, I don't think those were sustainable prices, and we have not seen significant growth in consumer income to be able to support. Yeah. Hugely expensive well, okay, it's harder, homes in the Bay Area. It's harder to get the loans then too because the rents are already getting so high. Well, Which is interesting why it's in, in increasing because of the limitations that are on uh, consumer income, the increase in health insurance costs, is how are the uptick in interest rates are how are people, homeowners, going to be able to afford these their homes and the increase in these prices? 
it, I've actually put my article similar to it was that homeownership has actually declined. So who, this bubble is who's actually making up this bubble, and is it sustainable going forward? Well, you know, it's, that's an interesting question, but and I just picked up a little piece of data when I was preparing for the show today, and and one of the things I found so interesting was that. Um, so the typical monthly mortgage payment the Bay Area buyers committed themselves to paying last month was $21.79. Adjusted for inflation, last month's payment was 23.6% below the typical payment in spring 1989, which was the peak wow. of the prior year cycle. And this is coming from you know DataQuick, which has been gathering data for the real estate market for a long time. So I, I found that, you know, if you're, if you're talking about affordability, which I think yes. you were, you know, adjusted for inflation, it sounds very reasonable, doesn't it? I'm going to guess that data is based on the rates we just kind of went through, but uh, I wonder if it's, it's certainly not looking ahead to what happens when interest rates hit five, five and a half, six. But that's still so historically low. I mean, oh, I know. I'm I know. dating it's myself when I tell low. you I had a mortgage payment in, let's see, what year was it? 1979? Yeah, good. I think I was paying 16% oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. interest. Yeah. But I also had a, a Dreyfus fund where I was getting 16, yes. right? Yeah, so, <laughs> oh, I remember money market funds paying 16%. Okay, we're going to cut to our third and final commercial break, and when we come back, uh, I'm sure Mark's got a couple of articles. And we'll spend more real estate news. Some more interesting stuff here. Okay, third and final trivia question. Uh, one more time on the TV show. Matt, oh yeah, yeah I see the eyes. <laughs> I don't know up. the answer. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, you're definitely not going to know this one. Okay, where did Hawkeye come from? The first three callers with the correct answer. Ooh, I think we may have stumped a couple of other people here. <laughs> The first three callers with the correct answer win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort. Their website is lighthouseforfun.com. Call 888-912-1190. That's 888-912-1190 to answer this question. On the TV show MASH, where did Hawkeye come from? Ah, Mark thinks he knows the answer to this one. No? Oh, I thought you shook your head yes. Make sure to include your name, your email address, and speak slowly. Spell out your email one letter at a time. Again, don't touch that dial because Stuff Best of Investing will be right back. specific you want to cover? Oh, I've got another article about uh, underwater homes buoy to the surface. Yeah. Or is it Bowie? Buoy. 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 They're, but they're on dry David land. Buoy. <laughs> <laughs> Not really considered the same. Well, yeah, the, I mean, the foreclosure thing, that, you know, and all that talk about the shadow and the story, yeah. it's like that. Uh, I've for years. Well, what are the banks doing? Have they released it? Well, everybody's back up on TV, and I think they're going to foreclose. I'm sure. No, no, but they've had yeah. foreclosures. What have the banks been doing with the interest rates? The shadow interest rate. I don't, yeah. I don't know. It's just not there. <coughs> we still need. Uh, that's a note. It's up to you. I'm, not, I'm waiting for headshot and bio. Because if you go to the Best Investing website, you see me, you see him, you see Robert. You don't see me. You don't see her. You hear her on shows, but she's like this. I mean, if there's a random gender. Right? Can I have a glamour <laughs> shot that uh, from the years ago? Yes, exactly. That's what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> I need to. He's one of those things you need me to do. I mean, don't get a lot of professional with that. Oh, no, no. I actually need to be a professional with that. You know, oh, it's okay. really good. It's that Cal and Fairfax. Um, I'll give you the name. I have a friend who's a wonderful oh, photographer. Yeah. He just does it. I know. He said, yeah, that thing. Um, what, what is it? Oh, God. And, and then, you know, have a kid. And then, yeah, once he has a kid, some children. You know what? Just send us a video. I'll, I'll just, yeah, oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'll just I, say, I, I can do that immediately. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I got to figure this out here.
Okay. So we hope that I'm playing for a little tell here. Um, okay, you got your article. Yep. Was there anything else, Captain, that you'd wanted to? I mean, I want to talk about how home ownership rate has fallen to the lowest in like 20 years. I mean, it was 60. That's a good dovetail after after yeah. what I've done here. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. If you got anything else, I'll chime in. Sure. Yeah. I mean, that's <coughs> 11. So exhale. So, so, yeah, sometimes, sometimes <laughs> again, he's winding his watch and kind of like teasing. Okay, here we go. Welcome back to The Best of Investing. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Mark Huff and Catherine Harris. And we're in also in the studio here with Julie Kennedy. When we cut the third commercial break, we asked this trivia question. On the TV show MASH, where did Hawkeye come from? No clue. No clue. That is not the name of the city. Anyone else? I'm feeling it's East Coast. Yeah, you, gotta, you gotta get it right to the mic. It's gotta be East Coast. It is. It's Crab Apple Cove, Maine. Uh, remember, he <laughs> right. said that a couple of times. Okay. Mark, uh, you have an interesting article you wanted to touch on. Well, in the last segment, we were talking a little bit about uh, you know the real estate market and the direction it's heading, which, you know, I don't know if any of our crystal balls are any good at this point. There's just so many variables. But, you know, again, you kind of go back to certain statistics, which I think are, are noteworthy. And, one of them, here's a short article about uh, underwater homes buoy to the surface. So we've been talking about how in, in, in the last few months at Best of Investing, how real estate prices have gone up, <clears throat> excuse me, you know, as much as 20 to 30 percent in some markets. Well, you would guess that this would be the uh, obvious effect. The number of negative equity homes plunged to just 15 percent of mortgaged homes. This is down 50 percent. This is down from 30 percent. Year ago, so that's uh, that's very noteworthy. Although I will say we still have a million homes in California with negative equity. It just happens to be half of the number it was um, a year ago, down uh, down uh, to fifteen percent. So it, the article goes on to say, expect increased listings by mid twenty fourteen as these positive equity owners retain brokers to sell. So that's good news for high inventory. It's also good news, I think, for the price stability, don't you think? Yeah. So we, uh, you know, stay tuned, and uh, we'll uh, maybe we haven't seen the uh, shadow inventory hitting the market, but this is the shadow inventory. This is really the inventory of potential foreclosure homes, people in short sale situations uh, that, uh, as a result of rising prices, uh, are seeing their homes. Uh, at or near a positive equity, or at least at a point where if they need to sell, they can. They may not walk away with much, but at least they can sell. Do, does that report reflect, uh, is that notice of defaults that the homeowners have already received because they have not made their payments? No, I didn't grab those charts, So, um, but I do know that from um, charts that I've seen in the last couple of months, that number has been declining. There's been a steady decline in uh, foreclosure filings. There's a steady decline in the uh, number of lates uh, that people are experiencing. But it's still, I mean, we're, we're still not out of the woods. This is still going to take several more years to correct. I mean, when you're still talking about a million homes in California underwater, that's just the underwater figure. I mean, you figure how much it takes to sell your home and the fact that if you're going to sell, where are you going to move to? And then if you need to make some money from your sale in order to have a down payment house, you almost have to include those that are uh, at break even or slightly above in that mix of distressed homeowners because if you have zero equity, you're technically not underwater. Or if you just have a little bit of equity, do you want to sell and be left with nothing and then uh, figure out why you're going to move well, to the next home? Unless you're moving to Crab Apple Main. Yeah, Crab Apple <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I'm also wondering about from the bank's uh, standpoint, are they less likely to do short sales because it's getting so close? Um, anecdotally, I can tell you that banks are um, becoming less and less in favor of um, agreeing to significant discounts in the price on a short sale. Let me just tell you that some of the best loans that I made in 2012 and 2013 to date have been to people who had a short sale offer accepted. They may have been in negotiation for as long as six months, 
by the time that it got accepted, it was normally significantly below current market value. That's happening less and less. In fact, you could, um, I saw people getting as much as a 20% short sale discount. Now you're lucky to get 10. And for some real estate investors who want to flip, that's, that's a deal that's too skinny. Mm -hmm. yeah. So again, um, if you think it's a good thing that real estate investors are starting to get pushed out of the market, then you know you will probably enjoy hearing that, or maybe you're just angry that real estate flippers are making all the money in this market. But the, which I don't think is a bad thing. I think it's a good thing. Again, it wants to trickle down. That's the way I look at it. Get a lot of people to work. Uh, make it an important part of the economy. But let's face it. Uh, you know, uh, banks are not giving properties away anymore. But I think the banks are also moving very quickly now in the short sale. I mean, before it could take six months. Before from beginning to end. Are you seeing that? Is that oh yes, okay. yeah. And I well, think that's good news. Uh, well, and it, again, it depends on the lender, but uh, you know that everybody has become more savvy. Yeah. And particularly because the banks don't want to commit to a price when they're seeing the rapid uh, depreciation. I was told recently in a deal that uh, um, this was a short sale opportunity that a borrowers uh, one of my borrowers was trying to capture, and they were frustrated with the bank feeling the bank wasn't negotiating in good faith because. They told the appraiser not to take into consideration any recent short sales, but they were looking at only as comps, only non-distressed retail sales. And so they thought, well, that's not fair because you're not going to give me an opportunity to, to buy this house at an investor level price. Which, again, if you're an investor, you're not going to pay retail. It doesn't make any right. sense. I mean, by definition, if you're an investor, you can't pay retail for a house because you just can't turn around and make any money flipping it. Uh, although most of my investors uh, are improving the property, but still. You know, that, that's interesting. I thought the banks weren't really supposed to tell the appraisers, you know, quote, what to that, do. Well, that's what I thought, too. But again, I think they can make it a policy saying, uh, for comps, we do we will not accept comps from more than Three one months. distress sale. Yeah. Interesting. Have you heard that? Yeah. Anyone else heard that? I haven't heard that, but that there is, I can maybe see as a policy, but it should be disclosed at the minimum. Right. That, 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 that if, if anything, that you know it's all non-distressed properties so that when people go in, so when investors going in, they know that when they're putting in their price. Yeah. Well, when I do comps for client, either a buyer or a seller, I always exclude um, short sale and foreclosure properties. It just doesn't make sense just comparing out. You know, and that's from a pricing but exactly. perspective, right? That's when you're trying to price well, for a fair but market. But even when you're, for example, sometimes we need to justify to an appraiser a price. Yeah. And we'll argue that oh, point. Oh, when you're qual trying to get your, your seller, qual I'm sorry, buyer qualified. Exactly. Yes. Like yeah. the, the appraisal might come back low. We say, well, what are you basing that on? And so if they're sh telling us that they're looking at short sales, yes. that's not an accurate um, indicator. That, that's a good point. I mean, I think, I think that is a fair thing to exclude them in that case. But, you know, gosh, it's weird. Just when the banks start telling the appraisers what to do, that's a little different. A little conflict. Well, yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, I'm heartened to hear that uh, that you're um, that you're seeing short sales uh, more successful in the shorter term because one one of the complaints that I was hearing for most of this year and most of last year was that the banks weren't being realistic and they were taking too long in the short sale process. And so now you're seeing it. It really depends on the lender. Well, especially if the lender is kind of sitting back waiting for the real estate market to increase. And, well, know. I think they would want to make sure that they at least get their money back. Because I think now, since prices have increased, they're content with yes with the prices that they're coming at that that borrower buyers borrowers are coming in. Where oh, that's good. that's a yes. good point because now they're not at being asked to take a huge discount. Exactly. Well, and, and we see properties coming on the market as short sales, and by the time they close, they're not short. Oh, interesting. Wow. Yeah. They, they go from being short sales to, oops, not short anymore. Wow. Well, and uh, at that point, does the bank still get involved? No. Oh. Remember, speak into the mic. Close. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can't hear you. Come, no. come, come on away. Um, you know what? I just want to kind of wrap things up here. Uh, Catherine Harris, so go ahead. What do you want to say? Well, I was just going to do we have a couple minutes? Yeah, well, a couple quick minutes. I know Mark talked about just kind of this uh, phantom inventory or this shadow inventory. And he talked about the variables that are going to happen in 2014. I'm curious to see what um, there are, like he said, multiple variables. What I brought, the articles I brought, talked about the American dream slipping away as homeownership within 18 years. 
Oh. It's all Bush's fault. It always is. <laughs> yeah. It's easy to point to somebody else. Um, Especially when he's not in office anymore. <laughs> exactly. And yes. now that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so the rate that soared to 69% in 2004 has backed down and gone down to a low, lower than I believe, just shy of 60%. And it's interesting to, we talked about just the increase in the uh, prices of homes in the last year, or the last six months, but the effect of interest rates. But I'm, again, just we talked about, or we briefly spoke about what's the composition of these buyers and what impact it's going to have in 2014 as the interest rates are determined or, or possibly stabilized. So I saw an article also talking about how they may, the Fed may actually tamper their their current policy as soon as next month, which I guess doesn't, it's basically <laughs> going to mean whatever, we just made that decision last week means nothing yeah, yeah. to anything or it means nothing in the, for the future. How can you plan anything there? I know. That's just the, that's it. I mean, I, I wish we all had a good crystal ball, but I guess that's what makes it uh, exciting. Yes, which is why we keep on talking every week. And that, I imagine, means the interest rates aren't even going to go down. I think that's what they were hoping to, but I just don't think yeah, that's going to happen short term. All right. Well, I want to thank my co hosts, Mark Hahn of Pacific Private Money, and Catherine Harris of Karate and Karah, and our new person here, Julie Kennedy. Thank you very much. Okay, thoughts for the day. Contentment is not the fulfillment of what you want, but the realization of how much you already have. Gee, I feel like the Wizard of Oz at the end of the movie. And uh, it's better to be an optimist who is sometimes wrong than a pessimist who is always right. Tune in next week to The Best of Investing, where we'll have more pro thought-provoking thoughts, and we're going to be giving away nine more free vacations for answering trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm Edward Brown, wishing you the best of investing. So long. And that's a wrap. Yay. Yay. Did you have fun? <laughs>